Oh, what is the upskies, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the GX Hockey Cast. We are on episode 56, and this is my weekly hockey show where I go through all of the major news and all that great stuff around the NHL. Focus in on the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Calgary Flames, but I can talk about any NHL team, so if they have big news and stuff going around that franchise, I will be talking about it on this podcast. So, we got a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about this week. Uh, As I'm recording this right now, the draft has not happened yet, it is going to happen tonight, so that'll be at the end of this episode, but... Until we get to the draft later on tonight, there is a lot to talk about, man. We got the Hall of Fame class has been announced. We got lots of shit going around the Calgary Flames right now. Everybody wants out of there for some reason. We got NHL awards results. We have a lot of trades and signings going down and just some other general news. So let's just dive into this thing. Where should we start? Let's start with the Hall of Fame class because that was kind of the thing I was waiting for last week but it, it was just it was I wasn't going I was too impatient I wasn't going to wait around for the announcements but now the Hall of Fame class has been announced and as expected you got Hendrick Lundqvist um, showcasing or being the main guy going into the hall this year and I really enjoy the theme of this Hall of Fame class which is goaltenders I really like this so you have Hendrick Lundqvist First ballot Hall of Famer. Absolutely agree with this. He's one of the... The thing about Hendrik Lundqvist is his consistency. This guy was so consistent throughout his whole entire career. Maybe he wasn't like the number one goalie every single year, but he was always in that top ten. Was always a very good goaltender. One of the best... I think he has one Vesna, and obviously we know he didn't win a Stanley Cup in his career. He had a couple of close moments there with the Rangers, and I mean, yes, this guy has one of the most, some of the most wins ever as a goaltender, an absolute steal in the draft when he was drafted. I think he was picked up in the seventh round. He is one of the most handsome men to ever enter the NHL and a first ballot Hall of Famer, so congratulations to Hendrik Lundqvist getting into the Hall of Fame. I feel very good about him getting in there, but there's also more goaltenders. We got Mike Vernon getting in there, a uh, man, he is a legendary Calgary Flames goaltender. He won the cup there. He won a cup with Detroit, I believe. He was there when they won their first cup in a, in a long time over there in Detroit. So Mike Vernon, I mean, fuck yeah. I'm really happy about that. You got Tom Barrasso as well. And I feel like I may have put a little disrespect on Tom Barrasso's name. I may have, When I was talking about goaltenders that kind of had a flash in the pan season, I brought up Jim Carrey, net detective. I think I said Tom Barrasso, and that was completely out of line, completely wrong. He was not a flash-in-the-pan goaltender, obviously, because he's going into the Hall of Fame. He was the goaltender in net for the Pittsburgh Penguins in the early 90s when they won their cups with Mario Lemieux and Yarmir Yager, so absolutely deserved. Again, another goaltender with a ton of wins, very consistent, and he did play a little bit there in the kind of the higher scoring era, so his numbers may not look super eye-popping or anything, but he was a goalie of his time. And we have Pierre Turgeon, which is, he was the, he had the most points of a player that had not yet been inducted into the Hall of Fame, so Pierre Turgeon getting in there, that's really cool, part of the Montreal Canadiens dynasties, I do believe. Obviously, these, a lot of these players here were before my time, so I don't get to have that you know, nostalgia factor of being being able to watch a lot of these players, but I did get to see Hendrik Lundqvist, so that was pretty cool. And then you have Carolyn Ouellette, who is a just a dynamite women's hockey player. She, you name it, she's won it. She's I think one of the few women who have won four gold medals. She is incredible, one of the best women hockey players of all time. And this leads me down to uh, a bit of disappointment, again, around the Hall of Fame induction ceremony and all that stuff. There are allowed a maximum of two women per year, which is ridiculous, by the way, because they have a lot of catching up to do, bringing in women into the Hall of Fame. So they've only just been recently adding women into the Hall of Fame. So, And even this year, they only picked one. When they can have two, they picked one. So... They're doing this very, very slowly. I don't really understand it. Let's just get the women in there now. Like, while they're young and can really, like, 
I don't know, enjoy the moment and stuff. Don't wait till they're like 78 years old and they're like not fully with it. But regardless, I mean, Carolyn Ouellette, one of the greatest women's hockey players of all time. So congratulations mightily for her. I'm very happy to see the women getting their due into the Hall of Fame. But even, even still, I don't think it's enough. You need to have more women in there. So, I mean, one's better than none, but still, there should be much more than that. We have um, some coach, we have a coach, sorry, it's Ken Hitchcock. I remember Mr. Hitch very well. He was a very prominent, uh, very good coach throughout his career, obviously, going into the Hall of Fame. Tons of wins. I don't think he got a, he might have gotten a Stanley Cup. I think he might have been coaching the Dallas Stars when they won the Cup, again, slightly before my time uh, being a hardcore hockey fan. But I do remember watching that uh, that playoff series. That was one of the... One of the earliest memories of me watching hockey that really got me into that was the Dallas Stars and Ed Belfour of the Dallas Stars back then. Anyway, Ken Hitchcock, I mean, lots of hilarious stories around this guy. I mean, if you're listening to Chicklets and stuff, if whenever they have a player that was coached by Hitchcock, they always ask about him. And he sounds like an absolute character, so congratulations to Ken Hitchcock making it into the Hall of Fame. And we have uh, GM Pierre Lacroix. I am not 100% uh, familiar with this, I would imagine, with the name Lacroix. You would have to think they were around that Montreal Canadiens dynasty, but my apologies. I don't really know all that much about Pierre Lacroix, but congratulations getting into the Hall of Fame. So with those, that's all the introductions for this season. And as always, with every year there's going to be the what about this guy what about this what about that and this so as always I mean my number one guy is Alexander McGillney one of my favorite players of all time definitely in that top five I absolutely adore McGillney he's one of the main reasons why I got into hockey and again this guy continues to get snubbed year after year and it's kind of shocking I mean it's I can understand maybe like this these years maybe because of the whole Russian invading Ukraine situation but I mean he has nothing to do with that I don't think he didn't invade did he but regardless he has been eligible for many many years prior to the whole Russian Ukraine situation and I am still baffled that this guy has not made it into the Hall of Fame not only was was he one of the most dynamic entertaining goal scorers in the hockey league at of all time arguably he's one of the most entertaining players to watch i think the first russian born player to hit a thousand points he's got a stanley cup he's got one of the best rookie seasons of all time where he scored like 70 something goals i mean and then not only his hockey career was incredible but his life story was incredible him defecting from russia getting shot at by his own countrymen escaping so he can play hockey i mean the importance of this man and what he did for russian hockey players in the nhl is un it's just unbelievable so i i'm still blown away that alexander mcgillney is still not in the hall of fame are they waiting to put in Ovechkin first? I don't really know what the fuck they're waiting for. Alexander McGillney should have been a like a first ballot Hall of Famer, in my opinion. And he's still not in there. And he's not the only one. There's some other players. I mean, Jeremy Roenick, a very, very good player in his prime. He was a, one of the best in his prime, for sure. He's still not in there. But, I mean, he hasn't been out for very, very long. And then you got a couple of the newcomers... Uh, that didn't get in this year. I don't think it's that big of a deal, but Zetterberg and Dadzuk, neither of them made it in this this year. And Dadzuk's still questionable because he hasn't like necessarily retired yet, so he may not be eligible for that reason, but they're not in there just yet. He got Rod the Bod, Brindamore. I mean, with his coaching career now and his very, very good uh, playing career, it's not like he was the most dominating forward. He was very, very consistent. He was very, very good, especially defensively. And his le- longevity in his career, where he kind of just seemed to be getting better and better with age. And then his great coaching career so far on top of that. I mean, with all that said, I think that Rod Brindabor should be in the Hall of Fame very, very soon. I'm hoping because that guy is awesome. And yeah, we already talked about the only two women per year. That's just silly. I mean, there's so many good women that need to be getting into the Hall of Fame. And sadly, like, I don't know every single name and stuff. But I mean, there's definitely 
a lacking of women's support in the Hall of Fame, and that's just a shame. So what do you all think about the Hall of Fame? Are you happy with the people that are getting in this year? I do really like the theme of goaltenders. I love goaltenders. I'm just, I always play goalie in pretty much every sport that I played. If there was a goalie spot, I'm probably playing goalie. I'm just a weirdo like that. I like goalie. But yeah, I'm curious to hear, what do you guys think? Is Who is your main guy that hasn't made it in, or female player, or even a coach, or a GM, or anything like that? Let me know, who do you think got snubbed the worst this season? So, speaking of snubbed, I feel like the Calgary Flames, as an organization, is getting a little bit snubbed right now. So, just for weeks now, almost every day I'm hearing about someone in Calgary wants out, some other guys on the block, and then not only that, we are starting to see Calgary Flames getting shipped out of Calgary, Tyler Toffoli being one of them. We will get there, we will get there, but the big one was, I mean, Noah Hannafin was kind of the first one that made it very known. He doesn't want to re-sign in Calgary, he doesn't want to play in Canada anymore, he would like to go back and play in the United States, and this is a running theme that... Uh, a lot of Canadian teams are going to be dealing with right now. I mean, I can't, I don't know what it is exactly. My, I think it's a, uh, accumulation of a handful of things that are causing players to leave Canada. I mean, I don't know if it has anything to do with the wildfires that are going on right now in Alberta, but obviously the high tax rate in Canada is, is not great. It's, uh, not the most affordable place, uh, in certain areas of Canada to live. Obviously it is a pain in the ass to get, uh, back and forth between the borders. If you are if you are an American citizen and you have family that are in the United States, it can be a big pain in the ass getting across uh, the border numerous times per year or however however much you have to go and travel and all that stuff. So, and of course, I mean it's it's kind of unsaid, but the the Canadian media around hockey in the NHL is just so much more intense over here in Canada, but. Uh, some places in Canada, much more so than others, like Toronto and Montreal and even Vancouver, they're very, very uh, scrutinizing of their teams when things are going wrong. And even when things are going right, there's always going to be an article about something going on, something wrong, something that they're complaining about, right? So players are going to get exhausted with that. Maybe players aren't so into being so well-known in Canada. Like players on Vegas, I well, let's not use Vegas right now. Let's say players in Detroit may not be so well known in Detroit as they would be in playing in Toronto. Like, everybody would know who Dylan Larkin was if he was playing in Toronto. Maybe not so much in Detroit. And especially in other places, LA especially. Like, there's so many, you know, celebrities and NBA. There's just so many bigger fucking tier uh, celebrities over there in LA. So a hockey player can definitely slip underneath the radar and have meals with their family in public. And it, it wouldn't be that invasive of their privacy. So I feel like a whole accumulation of a whole bunch of those kind of reasons are a reason why a lot of people are leaving Calgary. Um, but I still am a little bit baffled as to how many of them are really wanting out. I mean, they got rid of Daryl Sutter. They're bringing in new coaches. They got the new GM, a whole new look on the franchise. They're getting a new arena coming in. So what's the fucking problem now? Um, let's start with Hannafin. So he makes it known that he doesn't want to play in Canada. Okay, fair. So they're going to more than likely deal him here in the offseason. We could see him getting dealt tonight at the trade at the at the draft. We'll have to wait and see. It seems like it's pretty much written in stone that Noah Hannafin more than likely won't be playing for the Calgary Flames this upcoming season. And I mean, it sucks. You never want to have to lose a guy, but they're not going to lose him for nothing. He still has a, another year. The one decent thing about Calgary right now is that they they do have a pretty good looking blue line right now. So it's not that you you want to lose Hannafin, but I think the Calgary Flames are going to be able to deal with that better than other teams. They got Shillington, who is supposed to be coming back. And if they can get Stone re-signed cheap again, you know, that is a guy that seems to play well in Calgary. He's got a fucking bomb of a shot, which I find always very useful to have on a hockey team. It's just a big, powerful slab shot in the blue line, causes a lot of carnage in front of the net. So they could probably get him back really cheap and then add Shillington. So if they lose Hannafin, they're more than likely going to be shopping around for... It kind of depends what their future plans are. I mean, now that Toffoli's out, are they really trying to bounce back into a playoff spot? 
Uh, it's a little too early to tell just yet, but uh, we'll see. So I would imagine they're going to be looking to grab rather picks, uh, prospects, or they're going to be trying to look for a hockey trade where they trade off a defenseman and they get back a top six forward that they would be looking for. So could be something like that for Hannafin. We'll just have to wait and see what the word is right there. It kind of sucks that um, I don't know if he has a no-move clause or anything like that. If he wants out of Canada, I don't think he's going to make that much of a problem for them. He's, they'll, they'll find a place for him. And then there's the Backlund situation. And he kind of seems to be like one day he wants out, the next day he seems to want to stay. So I think right now is the situation is Backlund was upset. He didn't receive the captaincy. He's come out and said that last year that was uh, definitely something they were missing in the locker room was a captain that could stand up for the locker room, stand up for the boys, get into Sutter's face and try and calm down that situation. So he clearly wanted to have that role. And it kind of seems like maybe they're uh, kind of offering him that captaincy to stay. So if they give him the captaincy to stay, that's great. I mean, Backlit, he is on the back nine. He's an older player now. Probably could get him signed for... I, I don't know I don't really know on if they can give him a hometown. I don't know if he'd be willing to do that. He has been a flame his entire career, so if they give him the C, that would make him happy. If that would make him stay, I think I'm I'd be down with that. I'm totally good with Backlund. Longest serving flame, I would have to imagine right now. So giving him the C, yeah, it makes sense. And he wouldn't have it all that long. It's not like he's got another five to ten years on his career, right? So it would be a short term captaincy, but I think a deserved captaincy the guy has been here forever he's been a very very solid player all throughout and I would say he's a locker room leader at this point so I'd be down with him getting the captaincy especially if that means he gets to stay for a little bit because you don't want to lose every center on the team at the moment so that wouldn't be great and then you have the Lindholm situation he really see it doesn't as of right now it seems like he's leaning more towards leaving so I mean that's disappointing because Lindholm is a very very good player I know last year wasn't his best, but I I just think as a team, the whole team underperformed. So it's easy to think that he would have a comeback this season, but is he going to do that with the Flames or with another team? Kind of looks like he's going to leave again. That would suck, but they're going to have value with that. So they're going to be able to get something for a lot of these guys. They still have term. So there's something out there. I don't know who they're going to work with. I would love... You know, if if Hannafin would have perf- would have been fine with playing with Canada, I would have loved uh, something between the Leafs and Calgary. I think there would have been something there that they could have worked out. Get Hannafin over to Toronto and then get some forward over there into Calgary. Something like that maybe could have worked out. But again, that's just kind of speculation on my point at this moment. But yeah, so <laughs> fuck, we're not even done with Calgary yet. So they've lost to Foley. They, it's not that bad of a trade, man. I actually didn't hate it. I was super sad to see that Toffoli was gone. He was arguably the best, um, the best flame last year. He had lots of, he had thirty some odd goals or something. He was about seventy some odd points. So he he did pretty good, I thought overall. So the New Jersey Devils acquire forward Tyler Toffoli from the Flames for forward Igor Sharangovich and a third round pick. So. I saw the Sharon Govich name. I was like, oh, shit, cool. I uh, I like Sharon Govich, man. I think he is a good little player over there in New Jersey that might be getting a little lost in the shuffle. So bring him over to Calgary. They did re-sign him. We will talk about that. They gave him a little extension. I think it was two years or something. $3 million. So semi-low risk, especially if he can pop out, man. That could be a bargain for a couple of years. Now, uh, Devils fans, I would imagine... I mean, I would say you're probably good with that trade. I mean, you're going to get a more bona fide goal scorer, someone that's a little bit more ready to go, can probably give you some really good moments in the playoffs. He's been known to perform in the playoffs. So Toffoli, great ad for the New Jersey Devils. And it makes sense for both teams. I mean, uh, they're going to bring in a young forward into Calgary. That's kind of what they're going for here. They're going to bring an injection of younger players into the lineup. And Sharon Govich could be a good one. I don't know what he's going to provide for Calgary. Uh, he could be a 20-plus goal scorer. That would be, you know, the top end. That would be really good. I, I like Sharon Govich, man. I've heard lots of good things out of him. As long as he can get an opportunity, get some ice time with Calgary, this could be really good. So I, I like the move. I mean, it sucks to lose to Foley, but it makes sense in the long run. So I'm good with that move for now. 
And then the last little piece of sad news for Flames fans is that uh, Mitch Love has left for Washington. So uh, some people might not be aware of Mitch Love. He has been the, I believe it's the AHL coach of the year for the last two seasons. So a lot of people were speculating that Mitch Love would be potentially the next coach of the Calgary Flames, but kind of went by seniority at this point. So uh, Mitch Love did not get the job and now he's off to Washington. So he's not going to be the head coach over there either. So I think he just wants to get his feet wet into the NHL now. He's done with the AHL. He's done with the Mindsies. He wants to come up to the big show and Washington was offering him a spot. I don't know if Calgary offered him a spot or not, but it's understandable, man. I mean, at this point in Love's career, he really doesn't have any more to prove at the levels that he has been coaching at. He needs to come up and, you know, get his name out there in the NHL waters and see if he can get a head coaching job in a year or two. We'll have to wait and see for that. It sucks. Uh, we'll have to, I mean, I wish the, the best of luck for Mitch Love and his career onward from here. It would have been great to see him stick around with the Calgary Flames, but it's completely understandable why he has moved on. So with all that said, Flames fans out there, let me know. How are you guys feeling right now? Are we feeling good or bad? How do we feel about the moves that are going on right now? It almost seems like we're kind of in a retool for Calgary. I mean, what is what is going to happen with Vladar? I think Vladar could get moved here and they bring up Wolf to try and back up Markstrom. I think that would more than likely be the right thing to do here. I don't see a future with with um, Vladar here in Calgary. Unless, if they could move Markstrom, I wouldn't be against having Vladar and Wolf go for it. I mean, two young goaltenders. I know it's not the most comforting thing, but at this point with Markstrom, that cap, sp- that cap amount, the way that he's been playing with the Flames for the last like year and a half really isn't encouraging. So... If they could get out of the Markstrom contract, would you do it? Me, personally, I think I would, honestly. But that's uh, that's not really the point at this moment. Markstrom, one of the few Flames that has come out to say that he wants to stay. So, yeah, I mean, do you really want to try and move a guy that actually wants to be here? Kind of the thing that was said of, of Conroy is that he wants to have players he wants to bring in players that want to play here and want to stay so we'll see what it, what happens with the goaltending situation I'll have my eye on the Calgary Flames that's for sure they still have I feel a lot of work to go in this offseason there's still a lot more to be done so we'll see what's going on with them speaking of what is going on with Washington right now so uh word is they might be moving Uh, Not very far, but they want to move uh, a little bit further. They want to go out of Washington and go to Virginia, I believe. Uh, They want to move uh, the team over there into a new building closer to the Amazon building or something. And this mostly is for tax reasons. It's a substantially lower tax rate in Virginia where they want to move. So... I don't know what, I mean, it's going to be really awkward because, I mean, technically they wouldn't be in Washington anymore. Are they still going to call them the Washington Capitals? Are they going to change it to Virginia Capitals? I don't think so. And there's also uh, the Saudi, a part of the Saudi government or something has purchased a 5% stake ownership into the Washington Capitals. So this is probably the first uh, domino to fall in this type of situation. We're going to start seeing now that we have the, the Live Golf and the PGA, they've merged with that Saudi money. We got Saudi money coming into the NHL now, and I think this is just the beginning of all that coming down. So they definitely want to get their hands on into the, the sports market. There's a ton of money to be made here. I don't, I don't think we're going to see them full on owning teams just yet. That's probably a little bit further down in the future, but for now it looks like they're going to start buying up Uh, percentages of teams and yeah so that's going to be the start of that I really don't know in the long run what that's going to mean I mean they have a ton of money over there in Saudi Arabia so uh, I don't really know what this means for the league in the long run if if you have any ideas let me know because I I'm not sure people seem a little bit nervous about it because you know, it's, yeah, so I don't really want to get into it too much, but that is something that is going on currently in Washington, so there is that. 
Uh, something else that they've announced that is going to happen next season is that NHL players will not be wearing specialty warm-up jerseys anymore. So no more of the pride jerseys and warm-ups, no more of the the uh, hockey fights cancers, none of that stuff. They're still going to sell the jerseys and the and the proceeds from those jerseys are still going to go to those charities and all that. It's just that now the players won't wear them. Uh, Gary Bettman claims that it is a distraction and I mean he's covering for the five or six players in the league last year who made a big stink about not wanting to wear pride jerseys and so on and so forth so this basically boils down to five babies ruining it for everybody so another thing that the NHL is doing that you know they're they're falling over for a couple of people that are are, are still weirded out by the LGBTQ communities and all of that stuff. They're missing the point here, I think. I think they're still being very um, narrow-minded about this. And it's not about... uh, It's just about inclusion, man. It's just to make people feel supported and wanted and that you're not banished because you're different from someone else. I mean, I'm disappointed to hear this. Uh, It's very silly. I mean, it's... It really, it was such a small gesture from the players just to wear a jersey. And during a warm-up, it's really not a big deal. And of course, the five people out of the thousand, however, players are in the NHL, those are the ones that they're going to listen to. And those are the ones that they're going to fall over for their demands. So congratulations, you five bigots. Uh, You can just, you know... Just a shame, man. Just a real shame. It's um, it's not cool. And, um, I mean, hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on. Now I really want to get a Hockey Fights Cancer and a lot of those jerseys if I can. Sadly, sometimes they're extremely unaffordable. Makes me think of the those really cool um, jerseys that the Leafs were giving away. They were kind of based on the... First Nations or possibly I don't I'm not 100 percent but they were they were selling for over a thousand dollars and I mean that's great whoever bought it and those proceeds go to charity but why don't we make them a little bit more affordable for the masses and then you can get even more proceeds to those charities or whatever they're trying to get money for I mean it's just a thousand dollars I mean you're you're really I mean I know that hockey is kind of a rich kid sport and all that stuff but like come on now. So let me know what you guys are feeling about the NHL deciding to take away the practice jerseys for the players to wear before the games. Me, I'm very disappointed in that decision. It's just silly. So now that we've talked silly, let's get into some silly trade talks right now. So we got some we got some trades going down up in here over the last uh, week or so. So we'll start off with the Colorado Avalanche, they have acquired forward Ryan Johansson from the Nashville Predators in exchange for forward Alex Galchenyuk, or at least the rights to Alex Galchenyuk. So this is this is impressive. I mean, we know that the Colorado Avalanche was looking for center depth or at least a second line center because that was something they were kind of uh, missing since Kadri has left. So they're bringing in Ryan Johansson, who two years ago had a very good bounce back season with the Preds. Last year, not so much. So I feel like with the now with him going to Colorado, he's probably going to fall somewhere in the middle of those two seasons. I don't expect him to do what he did two years ago, but I would expect with a new change of scenery and a competitive playoff bound team, Ryan Johansson should step it up a little bit for them. So, uh, what do you call it? The Predators, they are going to be taking on 50% of that contract. So he's in and around $4 million for the Colorado Avalanche. So I like the move for Colorado. It's it's good for them. They want to try and get back into that Stanley Cup position that they can get into. They're still going to be down Landis Gog, So they're going to try and bring in some guys. And they're not done. They still have some other moves that they have done this week. But I like the move in terms of Alex Galchenia going to Nashville. I mean... On Nashville's side, you are, you know, you're getting out of that contract on Ryan Johansson. It's, uh, it was a little bit pricey. I mean, it wasn't the worst overall, but it was definitely a little bit of an overpayment. So they're getting out of that. They're getting some um, cap space. So that's nice. I don't know what they're going to do with Galchenyuk. I feel really bad for Galchenyuk, man. I remember the draft year. I wanted the Leafs to get him. They didn't. Thankfully, they didn't. They ended. I'm pretty sure that was the Morgan Riley year. So we're okay with that. But, I mean, Galchenyuk's been bouncing around all over the place. Flashes of okay seasons there. He looked decent in Montreal at times. 
Toronto, it looked like he had a fit there and he and he didn't want to stay. And then, yeah, it just it really has been uh, not a great situation for Alex Galchenyuk. I hope he can find something there in Nashville. That would be great. So I'm rooting for him to find something. That would be good. Then we got Arizona. They are making some moves. They acquire defenseman Sean Dursey from the Los Angeles Kings in, ex- in exchange for a second round pick in the 2024 NHL draft. So... Apparently, Arizona wants to ice a hockey team this year. So that is great news for them. That's awesome. So they acquire Sean Dersey, young defenseman. Uh, some of the numbers on Sean, on Sean Dersey show that he's not the best at 5-on-5, five five, but he's got some power play, specialty team skills. And he's young. He's on a fairly decent contract right now. He's not worth very much on the cap. So, hey, it's a it's a good move for Arizona. They got lots of fucking draft picks so it looks like it's time for them to start moving some draft picks bringing in some players i like the move it makes a lot of sense eras or uh, sorry la they got kind of a plethora of younger defensemen that could slide into that role so it makes sense it's a good trade for both teams and we will see how it goes for sean dersey in arizona arizona has a pretty good track record of making players look better than they actually are dersey already a pretty solid young defenseman so we'll see if he can be even better over there and now we got the chicago blackhawks they are making some moves over here they got the cap space and they are using it so they acquire forwards taylor hall and nick felino from the boston bruins in exchange for alec regula and ian mitchell so I would feel that this is mostly a cap dump for the Boston Bruins. They're getting out of the Taylor Hall contract and Felino. Felino was up, and the Chicago Blackhawks re-signed him for, I think it was one year, might be two, but it's $4 million. And they get Taylor Hall, so this is good. So you got Taylor Hall. He's a bit older now. I think he's like 31. So those heart MVP New Jersey Devil days, probably behind him. We more than likely won't be seeing that anymore out of him, but... Obviously, he's been in the league a very long time. A first overall pick, which you got a first overall pick coming in. So Taylor Hall might be able to uh, get Connor Bedard under his wing, maybe help him through being a young first overall pick in a big new franchise. So I can see that working. More than likely going to be Connor Bedard's winger. He's very fast. He has been a goal scorer. You know, it's definitely his goal scoring has dropped off, but... I could see that working. And then you got Nick Felino, just a solid two-way forward. Again, he's a bit older. He had a pretty decent comeback season last year with the Bruins. Will he be able to have that with the Blackhawks? I mean, he's more than likely going to have a bigger role with them as long as he can stay healthy. I mean, it's a low risk. It works. So Bruins get some cap space. They're going to need that to re-sign some guys, maybe get some more guys in. Looks like they want to try and use that money to re-sign Bertuzzi. So that could be incoming quite soon. Uh, we got a minor deal. New Jersey acquires forward Shane Bowers from the Boston Bruins in exchange for Riley Walsh. Kind of a minor league deal, not a big deal. This one, we got St. Louis Blues acquiring forward Kevin Hayes from the Philadelphia Flyers in exchange for a sixth round pick in the 2024 NHL draft. So this was uh, kind of in the in the works for a few days here. A lot of word coming out that Tory Krug might have been involved in this somehow, but he was not willing to um, move or uh, waive his no-trade con- clause or whatever, and people giving him a hard time about that. You can go to hell. It's his right. He got that in his contract for a reason, and he's exercising that right, rightfully so. I have no problem with Tory Krug doing that. So that's fine. Uh, Kevin Hayes, I mean, coming in, he had a pretty decent season last year with Philadelphia. I know the coach, uh, Tortorella, wasn't the biggest fan of him. 31 years old now. He had 54 points last season, 18 goals, 36 assists, played 81 of the 82 games. Uh, He did deal with some injuries prior, but other than that, fairly decent. So I'm trying to see here if, um, yeah, so Philadelphia is going to retain 50% of that deal. So it makes a lot of sense here. And we need to watch out for St. Louis, man. They have been making a lot of under, kind of under the radar moves all the way back to last season when they picked up Kapanen for free off waivers and they picked up, I believe it was Verona. So they're making some moves here. I would definitely be putting St. Louis on the tops of that bounce back season list. I feel like they're going to be making uh, a good push for the playoffs next year. So 
A good addition for them. We'll see how Hayes goes for them in St. Louis. He's been known to be a pretty good locker room guy. Some people may feel that he's a bad influence on the locker room because he likes to have maybe a little bit too much fun, but we'll see how it goes for him in St. Louis. I like the move for St. Louis. Adding some more center depth, it looks good. I don't know if he's going to play second or third line. We'll have to wait until the season begins because... Ryan O'Reilly's out there. He seems to be connected to St. Louis. So maybe Ryan O'Reilly's the third line. Kevin Hayes' second line. Then you got, uh, is, is Thomas the center? It might be Cairo, but regardless. Looking pretty good over there in St. Louis, I must admit. Then we got the Canadians. Montreal Canadiens acquiring forward Alex Newhook from Colorado in exchange for defenseman uh, Gianni Fairbrother. Hell of a name. And a first round and second round pick in the 23 draft. So that first round is I believe that was Florida's pick so that is 31 so basically two second rounders for new hook I mean a younger forward he really hasn't found his stride all the way there in Colorado so coming over to uh the Montreal Canadiens a young up-and-coming team could be a nice fit for him I I was a little bit surprised that it took a first and a second to get him but he still has some upside and Montreal again a team on the rise I feel like they got most of their prospects in place. They're going to get another good one here on the draft tonight. So I'm okay with this deal. And again, I mean, a smart move for Colorado. They're getting rid of a player here that maybe they're they're willing to move on and maybe get an older forward that they could be more reliant on. And they're getting a first and a second. So they're recouping some of those lost assets. So it's not a bad move. And then we got the fucking Pierre-Luc Dubois saga continues onwards so out of nowhere overnight all of a sudden he's like i'm all la now like not the habs i'm all about la la acquire forward pierre luc dubois from the winnipeg jets in exchange for forwards gabriel excuse me gabriel velardi rasmus kupari alex iafalo and a second round pick in the 24 draft so well done winnipeg i think they got a hell of a package for dubois Considering that he was a a 60-point player, I know he's definitely got that fiery edge to him that looks good in the playoffs. He's performed well in the playoffs throughout his career so far. But I think uh, what Winnipeg brings back is pretty tasty. I mean, Velarde kind of had a breakout season last year. He was scoring some goals. Kupari, I think, is kind of a bottom six forward, but not a bad piece. And then I... Alex Iafalo had a very nice season last year. Again, looks like they're adding in two top six players right here. I like this move for Winnipeg, and they're getting a second rounder. They're getting out of Pierre-Luc Dubois, so that kind of haze over the team of, oh, this guy just wants out. He doesn't want to be here. That's going to go away now. So things are looking good for Winnipeg. They're clearly not done yet. You still got Hellebuck. They still got Wheeler. They still got Shifley. What are they going to do with those guys? But I like what they brought in here for Pierre-Luc Dubois. They get out of that. LA re-signs him for a very big extension. We'll talk about that in a moment. We got the, uh, we'll skip that one. That's a small deal between the San Jose. This one's interesting. So San Jose acquires goaltender Mackenzie Blackwood from the New Jersey Devils in exchange for a sixth round pick. So, I mean, might sound like kind of a steal here for San Jose, but I I must say that the, the stock of Blackwood has kind of skyrocketed downward. Um, he's dealt with some injuries over the last few years. He looked good uh, a, a few years ago. Looked like he was going to be a very good goaltender. He was even considered to be on Team Canada at points. And uh, yeah, it really hasn't been that way for him since then. But it, it's it's a very low-risk move for San Jose right here. I mean, they're paying a six, so basically nothing. Give a guy a shot. If he can stay healthy, maybe he finds his game back. If not, oh well. San Jose's in the middle of a rebuild anyway, so if he sucks, that's going to give them a very good shot at getting another very quality draft pick next season. So, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, New Jersey, they weren't really using him. They kind of have their goaltending situation uh, figured out without Mackenzie Blackwood being in it. So, it makes sense to me. Then we got the New Jersey Devils acquiring Tyler Toffoli. We've talked about that trade. I like it for both sides. Getting more experience there for New Jersey for their playoff uh, move. And then Calgary's going more young. So they're bringing in Sharon Govich, who I think could be, could potentially be a very solid top six forward for the Flames. We'll have to wait and see how he does there. 
We got the Colorado Avalanche making more moves. They, this time, they acquire forward Ross Colton from the Tampa Bay Lightning in exchange for a second rounder in the 23 draft. So there you go. That looks like that could be their new hook replacement. Definitely a guy that has the playoff experience. I think he's more of that bottom six forward, but a solid addition here for the, what do you call them? The Colorado Avalanche. There you go. I'm blacked out right there. Okay, and we will swing over now to some of the signings that have gone on over the last week or so. We left off last week with Sean Monahan. So we got Buffalo re-signing Gergensons. I mean, you kind of have to. The guy is like the longest running Buffalo Sabre. He signs a one-year deal worth two and a half million dollars. I am good with that. I'm going to skip a lot of the smaller deals, but Columbus, they re-sign Olivier, two years, $2.2 million, $1.1 million per. Pretty minor deal, so I'm fine with that. Joey Anderson signs with the Chicago Blackhawks. Depth forward signing right there. New Jersey re-signs Eric Halla to a three-year, $3.15 million per year contract. Uh, he was a good little forward for them. I mean, he's kind of a middle six. Uh, he can slide into a top six role at times with injuries. Better suited, I would say, for the bottom six. But a nice little signing. A good... Good little signing for Halla. I mean, I think it's a little bit steep, but with the with the cap going up over the next couple of years, it should be fine for the most part. Lots of minor league deals here. You got Connor Ingram getting signed a three-year deal, uh, $1.95 million per with the Arizona Coyotes. So I know Ingram's numbers, his goals against might be a little bit alarming, but his save percentage was a 907 with... Arizona last year, they were pretty terrible. He's got an above league average save percentage right there. So I think it's kind of well-deserved if Arizona starts to step up like they claim to want to be, start adding some better defense. Maybe Connor Ingram's goals against will get substantially better. And if you can keep that save percentage in and around that 907, I think it's a pretty solid deal. So it looks like they're going to have Ingram and Vimelka for their tandem again next season. Still a lot of discussion around Vimelka if he will get traded to someone or not but I think there's some bigger better names in terms of goaltenders out there right now so if the team's really really serious you should probably be looking at a Connor Hellebuck if you're if you're really serious I've even heard UC Saro's name getting floated around out there which is pretty amazing anyway moving on we got Jordan Stahl re-signs with the Carolina Hurricanes so their captain sticking around for four more years at a $2.9 million per year cap hit. It's um, it's a little bit, it's a, it's a decent deal. It's not bad. I mean, Jordan Stahl, he's on the back nine of his career, but his defense is still really good. So you're going to be able to rely on that defensive ability. The, the, the goal scoring and all that, I mean, it's going to probably trail off here as those years go on. But your captain... He's given you a bit of a discount there. He could have got more somewhere else, but with the added years, you're going to get a little bit lower cap hits. So I would imagine most Carolina fans are good with this signing. We got the Nick Felino, four years, one year with Chicago. We did that. Uh, New Hook, he hasn't re-signed just yet with the Habs, so we're still waiting on that. Evgeny Dadnov signs a two-year deal with the Dallas Stars, worth $4.5 million in total. So that's like, what, 2.25 or something like that. Pretty good. That's not a bad little deal right there. I can get behind that. Pierre-Luc Dubois gets the big eight-year extension with the Los Angeles Kings. Um, I don't know if Winnipeg signed this or LA did. It claims here that Winnipeg did, but... It doesn't matter. L.A. has it now. So eight years, $8.5 million. That was the number floated around for Dubois for quite a while now. Eight and a half to nine. Getting the eight and a half. We'll see how that goes. I mean, he's he got about 60 points. He looks like he's kind of a 30, 30 guys, 30 goals, 30 assists. He's big. He's kind of a power forward, a center. He's a good player. He's a really good player. It might be a little pricey for now, but... If he can, I think he might be able to get more points there in LA. I think they might have a, I don't know. I mean, Winnipeg's got some good wingers over there too. But Dubois could potentially get more. He could get less now though, that he's not really fighting for a contract. He's got eight years now. So he could, but I could definitely see Dubois maybe falling off now a bit now that he's not fighting for a contract. But 8.5, let me know what you guys think of that one. We'll, that one's going to have to take some time. He's still a young guy, so... 
If he stays around 60 points, I mean, it won't be a great deal, but it'll be fine. It's it's doable, and it's a really big addition for the LA Kings, who had a very, very fucking good team last year. They're getting even more offense added now, so they're a team to watch out for, for sure. Then you got Calgary re-signing Yuran Govich. It is a two-year deal worth $3.1 million per season. So again, it's only two years, low risk. If he fucking breaks out, they're going to have to break open the wallet and pay this guy. But if it, if it doesn't happen and he just kind of stays where he's at, then yeah, no, it is what it is. So I don't hate it. And we got the David Comp signing. So the Leafs are giving him a four-year extension. $9.6 million in total, coming out to $2.4 million per season. So, Leaf fans out there, how are we feeling about that? So, myself, a Leaf fan, I love David Camp. I think he was one of the absolute diamonds in the rough that Sheldon Keefe found for us, and he has been fantastic, an amazing penalty killer, great defensively, offense, not so much, you know, he's not definitely, he's not out there scoring goals and getting points on the regular, but... Very good on the face-offs, extremely good defensively, so it's a little bit much. You know, I get nervous when they're signing bottom six forwards for an extended period of time. We'll see how that plays out. I mean, it's, oh, it's, it's I feel good that we're going to have a defensive rock down there, but I don't like the fact that he doesn't really bring the offense whatsoever, so... It's an okay deal. It's not great. It's not bad yet. It could get bad, but we'll just have to wait and see on that one. And then finally, we've got the Timo Meyer contract. Fucking New Jersey is handing out the dollar bills this year. Eight-year extension, $8.8 million per season. What do we think about that? So again, uh, very comparable to Dubois. He's not a center, but they're kind of comparable power forwards. 60, 70 points, Timo Meyer. Uh, you know, a little bit nervous of the way that he got, he fit into the lineup with New Jersey. He really didn't do a whole lot for them in the playoffs or anything like that. Now they're giving him the eight-year extension, so they're doubling down on him, hoping that he finds his, uh, his, his place in the lineup over a full season. So we'll see how that goes for New Jersey. Uh, he's still quite young. I think he's only 25, 26 years old, so... It, it, it would be movable if, if something goes wrong, I would imagine, but seems good so far, but again, we're just going to have to wait and see on that one. New Jersey Devils fans, how are you guys feeling out there right now? Handing out a lot of money, um, but I like a lot of those contracts. I mean, the Jesper Bratt one looks good. We all know that Hughes and he share they all have really good deals right now, so things are looking Pretty tasty for New Jersey. I would still like them to add in some size. Maybe a Lucic comes over. Maybe they add a Corey Perry. Corey Perry and Palat. That could be dangerous for New Jersey. So we'll see what's going on uh, with the signings continuing onward. But that is everything for up until now at 4 p.m. on Wednesday. And now I'll just touch on a couple of smaller pieces of news before we get into all the draft results. Uh, Spencer Knight is to return and fall from the player assistance program. So uh, he was entered into that last last season, and he's been dealing with his struggles since then. But he seems to be coming out on the other end of it. So this is great news. Uh, very, very happy to hear that about Spencer Knight. I hope that he can get back on track with Florida. He kind of missed a big uh, situation with them over this uh, last little bit. But hopefully everything is okay with them. There's a lot more important things than playing sports and winning and stuff. Mental health, whatever was going on with him. I'm glad that it appears that he is out on the other side of that now. So good to hear that from Spencer Knight. Hoping that he will have a nice bounce back season for the Cats this season. Because they're going to need him. And then, speaking of, they're going to need him, but I guess not anymore. Eric Johnson is going to be leaving the Colorado Avalanche. So, sad news for Avs fans out there. A very long-tenured player for them. And, I mean, fuck yeah. It's, it, I mean, I'm just happy that he got his cup there. Uh, nothing would make me more upset than, let's say, if Colorado didn't win the cup. And then he leaves, and then they win it. And it's like, oh, dude, he's been there for so long, and he didn't get it. Like... If Morgan Riley by chance gets traded by the Leafs and then they go on to win a cup, I would definitely have a hole in my heart with uh, not seeing Morgan Riley lifting that cup up as a Toronto Maple Leaf. There would be something very wrong with that picture. So I'm glad that he got his cup. But yeah, that kind of sucks that he's leaving. But another team is definitely going to want that 
uh, leadership. He's going to want that experience. So, yeah, he's without doubt going to find a, a home somewhere else. And then we got the Boston Bruins. They will be changing their logo this upcoming season for their 100th season. So their centennial season. Wow, Boston Bruins, 100 freaking years. So kind of going back to an older style of their logo. Uh, they they've kind of <laughs> haven't changed a whole lot about their look over their entire uh, existence. But they're going to go back to an older look. It's supposed to only be for the one season. So Bruins fans out there. Uh, pick up the jersey, I, I would say, because it's only going to be one uh, from what I can tell. But yeah, if I was a Bruins fan, I'd be probably picking up that jersey if I was y'all. But I'm not a Bruins fan, so I would never, ever buy a Boston Bruins jersey, ever. Even if they even if they had a Phil Kessel one and it was like $5, I'd think about it really hard. I'd think about it really, really hard, but I just don't think I could bring a Bruin thing into this household. So... Let's do the NHL awards, uh, the results and everything. I mean, it's pretty standard stuff. I didn't watch the awards show. Uh, I don't usually ever because it's rather boring. And this one was in Nashville, so there's going to be a lot of country music. I'm not a huge country music guy. I, I, def I don't hate it as much as other people do. Like, I love Shania Twain. But anyway, uh, Connor McDavid takes the Hart Trophy as the MVP. I'm fine with that. P Bergeron takes the Selkie, best defensive forward. Fine with that. Connor McDavid takes the Ted Lindsay as a uh, player awarded uh, by his peers. Makes sense. Norris Trophy goes to Eric Carlson. Now there's going to be people that don't like that, but regardless, the dude got a hundred fucking point season as a defenseman, first time in a very long time that happened. So. I mean, the Norris has, has not really been about the best defensive defenseman. It's always just been about uh, the one that could put up a lot of points. So Eric Carlson gets that. Eh, it, it's whatever. Anze Kopitar takes the Lady Bing. Okay, I'm good with that. Uh, as the most gentlemanly player, I do believe. Uh, we got Matty Beneers taking the Calder. Uh, it was pretty written in stone that he was going to have it locked up. It would have been a lot better if he had a nicer back half of the season, but... I'm fine with that. Honestly, I, I really liked what Owen Power did this season. I thought it was very, very impressive. Uh, Vesna goes to Linus Allmark. So does the Jennings. So best goaltender in the league and the lowest goals against. Also shared with Jeremy Swayman. So uh, all makes sense right there. King Clancy goes to Michael Backlund. I don't remember what the Clancy's all about. Art Ross goes to Connor McDavid, obviously, for the most points. Chris Letang, Bill Masters, Ma Masterton Trophy for the dedication to hockey. Uh, I did like his, I didn't see this, but I heard uh, he, what he said in his speech, how he's like, it's not really good to get this award because that means something bad happened, and he is absolutely 100% correct about that. Uh, he had a rough year, man. He dealt with a stroke, he dealt with injury problems, and he dealt with the loss of his father, so just a really, really tough year for Chris Letang, so all the respect sent out to that man right there. Maurice Rocket Richard goes to Connor McDavid for the most goals. Jim Montgomery wins the Jack Adams for coaching, <clears throat> excuse me, coaching the Bruins this year. Absolutely. Steven Stamkos gets the Messier Leadership Award for being a good leader. Dean Smith wins the Willie O'Ree, and so does Jason McCrimmon. So that's all the award show stuff. Did anybody watch it? I don't, I, I'm not interested in that at all. I definitely will be watching the draft, and that is what we're going to be talking about next, but I have to wait until I watch it. So I'll be right back. All right, now the draft is all over, and it was a little bit underwhelming. I mean, there were some trades that have gone down now since I stopped recording and watched the draft, so... We'll talk about the trades in a second, but let's do the draft. So, unsurprisingly, Chicago takes Bedard first overall. And then after that, that's where kind of, I would imagine, a lot of people's draft boards started to get a little crazy because the Ducks take Leo Carlson second overall over Adam Fantilli. So, a lot of the... It seemed pretty uh, consensus that Fantilli was going to be the second overall pick, but... I don't. I am totally fine with the Ducks making the Carlson pick. It makes sense. He's big. He's got all the tools to be a very good top line NHL center. So, I mean, I think flip flopping them. We'll see in the like when it comes to all of these picks. It's going to take a few years before we figure out who was a bust, who wasn't a good pick, who's a great pick, and all that stuff. For right now, all we can really do is speculate. But. I like the Ducks picking Carlson at three. And then three and four, it's it's all centers from one to four. You got Adam Fantilli at three, 
And Will Smith going to California, San Jose takes him. So the Fresh Prince of Bel Air is going to California. San Jose, yeah, so that's cool. And then, uh, for me, this is where I was like a little bit like, oh, okay, so they're not drafting necessarily by best player available. They're going by need. And the Habs take defenseman David Reinbacker. Carey Price blacked out on stage. It was horrible. Bobby Clark probably so amped right now that finally he won't be the one on every draft getting replayed for messing up Claude Giroux's name. Now it's going to be Carey Price just blanking as hard as I've ever seen a human being blank on a name on David Reinbacker. So they take him. I mean, he was arguably the best defenseman available in the draft. It was between him and the sixth overall pick, Simashev. But Reinbacker, I mean, he's going to probably be a good defenseman. The Habs, I felt like, already had a pretty nice young blue line on the upcome. I was expecting them to take forward here, but they surprised me by taking David Reinbacker. I mean... Probably the best def- uh, defenseman in the draft, but we'll have to wait and see on that one. Arizona, they went for defensemen, European defensemen in this draft. They take Simashev sixth overall. I mean, he's a very smart defenseman, so it's going to be a bit before we see this guy. Probably three or four years, maybe longer, but uh, I'm fine with this pick as well. I mean... But where Philadelphia comes in at 7, they must be very happy to see that Mishkov was still available and they take him at 7. And the Capitals are probably crying because they were so darn close. But Mishkov coming to Philadelphia makes a lot of sense. They're just entering a rebuild, so they're in no rush to get this guy into the lineup. He's already said that he wants to play in Philadelphia, so... That's a good sign, and I like that pick a lot for them. Ryan Leonard goes to Washington at 8. Really, really like that pick. I mean, again, another guy that they're probably like, wow, surprised he's still here. We will gladly take him. Then you got Detroit at 9. They take Nate Danielson. This is, uh, in, on some boards, a little bit off the board of a pick. Um, he projects to be a good second-line center in the NHL, very smart, responsible forward. So Detroit was uh, kind of eyeing up guys that were smart, responsible players. Um, I per- personally was a little bit surprised they didn't go with the next guy selected, and that's Dvorsky. He seemed like one of the most safe picks in the draft. His ceiling and floor seem to be pretty close together. So even if he's a bust, he's still going to be a good NHL player. If he hits the ceiling, he'll be a very good NHL player. So I like the pick there for St. Louis. And then I was really interested to see who Vancouver would, what they would do at 11. No trades, no picks getting moved, which was very surprising to me. They take uh, Tom Willander, defenseman. I thought maybe they would go with Axel Sandin Pelika, but he goes a little bit later. So they're taking Tom Willander, Swedish defenseman, I do believe. So I'm good with that. I, I mean, everyone from here on out, it's pretty okay. So I'll just kind of pop by a few of the names that were pretty good. So you got Daniel Boot. Uh, he is a big, big forward. Seems to be a little bit of a reach at 12, but again, we'll have to wait and see. Zach Benson at 13 appears to possibly be uh, a chance of being a steal here in the draft. He was projected to go a bit higher than that. Brandon Yeager, I I was um, around this guy. He projected to be a top five forward or a top five uh, pick in this draft earlier on, but he's kind of fallen a little bit. He falls to Pittsburgh. I like that pick there for them, a center. I know they got Crosby Malkin, but they're going to have to replace those guys at some point. Brandon Yeager could be that guy. The Calgary Flames took Samuel Hanzek. He is a... Uh, it seemed to be a safe pick a little bit. He seemed that seemed to be where he was going to get drafted. They take him a forward, and he seems to be pretty decent. I mean, wasn't a whole lot said about this guy. Colby Barlow, taken at 18 by the Jets, seems to be a pretty nice pick for them. Barlow projected to go a bit earlier than that, so we'll keep an eye on that one. That could be a good pick. At 23, the Rangers took Gabriel Perot. He's supposed to be a very highly skilled forward. A bit undersized, I do believe. That's why he dropped a bit. But this could be that usual, oh, he's a little bit undersized, but incredibly skilled. Why did he fall so far in the draft? Gabriel Perot could be that pick in this one here. And then the Leafs, they took a guy called Easton Cohen at 28. Uh, right winger. Now, he, I've heard some projections that this guy was, uh, could have been picked as late as a fourth rounder. Word on the street is that this guy has insanely high work ethics. So, I don't know. Maybe they're trying to think that they got themselves the next Zach Hyman right here. Time will have to, we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. And then I'll just go to the second round a little bit. I'll pop up to 
There was uh, the first goaltender that was taken was the third pick in the second round round by Chicago. Adam Gajin, goaltender. I actually have not heard a thing about this guy, uh, so I don't know anything about him. Uh, Sixth, Arizona took Michael Herball, who was the highest rated goaltender in this draft. So he gets taken sixth overall in the second round. And then the next highest ranked goaltender was Trey Augustine. He gets taken ninth by the Detroit Red Wings. So all in all, the draft is all done now. We're gonna It's going to be a minute until we find out which one of these guys is going to be really good, which ones get into the NHL right away. It does seem that Con- Connor Bedard is going to be in the NHL. It looked like that he was signing his entry-level contract right there at the draft table. So probably going to be seeing him, I feel that is safe to say. With everybody else... It's. I think it's still up in the air. Even with guys like Leo Carlson, Adam Fantilli, Columbus Ducks, they kind of wouldn't give us an answer if they are or aren't going to be in the lineup. So, now let's talk about some of the trades that went down uh, during and after this draft. So, this one, oof, this one caught me. So, the Pittsburgh Penguins acquire forward Riley Smith, one of the misfits from the Vegas Golden Knights in exchange for a third round pick in the 24 draft. So, basically a cap dump we're going to be seeing a lot of these where guys are just getting traded for basically nothing so I mean it's a good ad for the Pittsburgh Penguins you're going to get a winger that could potentially be playing with Crosby and or Malkin and he's just won a Stanley Cup he had a major role in winning that Stanley Cup so yeah he is going to be a piece that Penguins fans are going to be pretty happy with getting I think he's got rather two or three more years years I think two more years left on that five million dollar deal so it could be an I think it'll be fine for it's not a very long deal it's definitely not the Grandland deal so we don't have to worry about that then you got the Chicago Blackhawks staying busy they acquire forward Josh Bailey and a second round pick in the 26th draft from the Islanders in exchange for future considerations on the move yet again so cap dump right here apparently Chicago is going to be buying out Josh Bailey so he is going to be off into the free agency so he's going to be playing for someone else so I mean kind of a shitty way for Bailey's career to end in New York he was there for a very long time and now it's over so Chicago doing the right thing they are utilizing their cap space getting some picks in there makes a lot of sense good move we got Detroit. They're they're another busy team as well. They acquired forwards Kaylor Yamamoto and Clem Costine from the Oilers in exchange for future considerations. On the move again. Good lord. So yeah, another kind of a cap dump right here. I am devastated to see that Kaylor Yamamoto didn't make it in Edmonton. That sucks. I thought the dude was going to be awesome. And Clem Costine had some flashes of looking really good there in the playoffs last season. He looked like he was playing pretty well. So that's the end of those two in Edmonton. Edmonton fans, how are you feeling about that? Like, I liked Yamamoto. I thought he was pretty good. But yeah, you would have wanted him to be a little bit more uh, getting more points than he was. But yeah, that's that's the end of that. And then Chicago. They acquire forward Corey Perry from the Tampa Bay Lightning in exchange for a seventh round pick. So basically, the rights to Corey Perry, he still needs to be signed. And this makes a lot of sense. If you're going to have Connor Bedard entering the league, why not have the worm, the biggest goon around in Corey Perry to watch his back? Makes a lot of sense. Would have loved the potential for Corey Perry to maybe be a Toronto Maple Leaf. I mean, it's still, he's not officially signed, but it, it could maybe happen. So that's really cool. So that is everything that's going on right now. Uh, let me know what you guys thought of the draft. Did you watch the whole entire thing? I tapped out at about pick 13 because I was like, I don't got three hours to watch this shit. And I didn't ta- I didn't watch any of the rounds two to seven. So um, congratulations to David Poyle. That is his, he's done as GM of the Nashville Predators now. Hell of a run for the guy. So congratulations are in order for him as I think every single person that went up on the stage congratulated him. So he's good. He's nice and ballooned up with congratulations. So that's it for me, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back again on the weekend with the WrestleCast. We got money in the bank this week, so there'll be an extra review for that. GamerCast is going to be on Final Fantasy VI this week, so going back to the Retro Backlog series, we'll be talking all about Final Fantasy VI next week. And yes, so you can send in your questions and all that stuff on Twitter. These go up on the YouTube channel as well. Links are all down in the description. Follow along on Twitter for announcements and all that great stuff. And again, thank you everybody so much for watching. We're so close to the weekend. God, oh, it's right there. We're so close. Oh, it's Canada Day too. That's sweet. All right, everybody, enjoy your day and get to that weekend safe and happy. We'll be back again soon with some more GX Plus Cased.